tell you right now, Council, and all the members here gathered, that I misled the Congress. Furthermore, I am admitting to you that I participated in the preparation of documents for the Congress that were erroneous, misleading, evasive, and wrong. I wonder whether you would have the Congress do nothing after it has been lied to and misled and ignored. Would we in Congress then be true to our constitutional responsibilities? The Iran-Contra hearings revealed some deeply embarrassing flaws in the American system. And yet the hearings themselves, as a political act, were a proud demonstration of what may be the single most extraordinary achievement of the great Western democracies. Freedom of information, of the press, of inquiry, the right of all to know. I went to Harlem in Holland to start tracing how those freedoms were built from religious reforms, new technologies, and the blood of people I call democracy's heroes. There's a story that around 1440, or on Custer, dropped in the sand a carved letter A that he had made. And looking at the impression it made in the sand, conceived the idea of filling that impression with molten lead to make movable types for printing. It's always risky to assign single causes to anything in history. But there are two events which I believe have been absolutely crucial in the struggle for democracy. One was the birth of Christ, and the other was the invention of this stuff, movable type. Christianity, despite monarchs and priests and popes, finally spread the dangerous democratic idea of equality in the sight of God. And in the end, that would be the downfall of the old inherited aristocracies. And movable type, whether it was first made by Coster or Gutenberg, gave us books and pamphlets and newspapers. And they spread the power of information and conspiracy so widely that tyranny would never again have an easy night's sleep. Looking out over the rolling countryside of southwest England is a manor house, where about 80 years after Coster and Gutenberg, there began a conspiracy between Christianity and printing, which I think is one of the great milestones on the road to freedom. A language scholar named William Tyndall came to work here as tutor and chaplain to the family. It was in this manor house that Tyndall conceived an extraordinary idea. He would translate the Bible into English. I don't know whether Tyndall realized that that was a radical political idea, but the king and the bishops did. They knew that as long as the Bible was in Latin, they could make God's commands to the people mean anything they wanted them to mean. And remember, everybody believed in God. And so translating the Bible into English meant transferring political power into the hands of the people. Tyndall began to work right here in this house, but the lord of the manor became fearful and asked him to leave. And soon Tyndall realized that his life was in danger everywhere in England. Martin Luther was already busy translating the Bible into German, so Tyndall headed off for Germany. He thought he would be able to print there and then smuggle the Bibles into England. By early in 1526, Tyndall had finally succeeded in getting a complete edition of the New Testament printed at Worms. There were originally 6,000 copies. This is one of only two that still exist. Many of the Bibles were seized in Europe before they'd even left and destroyed there. And those that were seized in London were brought here to the spot where Paul's cross used to stand, just outside the famous cathedral that was built much later, and ceremonially burned. Tyndall went into hiding. Over the next few years, he moved every few months from city to city, lugging his library with him across Europe and working feverishly to finish his translation of the Old Testament. Finally, a British secret agent named Phillips tracked him down in Antwerp, had him arrested and thrown into prison, here in Vilforda, near Brussels. 
And then on October the 6th, 1536, we brought him out of the prison, as far as we know, just about to this very spot on the banks of the muddy Seine. And the hangman strangled him here, but stopped before he was dead, and then he was dragged off over here towards the public square. The stake had been set up here in front of the church, not very far from the entrance to the town. They tied him to it and lit the fire. Historians have been a little bit careful about identifying whoever it was that sent Phillips after Tyndall. But at the last moment, he may have given us a clue because as the flames licked up around him, he called out with his last breath, May God open the eyes of the King of England. Monarchs and bishops and dictators and governments have never stopped trying to smother uncomfortable truths ever since Tyndall. But Tyndall's flame kept on burning. All over Europe, presses were cranking out not just Bibles, but long-forgotten stories, stories of Rome and Athens with their intriguing republics and democracies. And an avalanche of new ideas about man and the universe and conscience and justice and freedom. And more and more, that has come to mean the freedom to know and to share what you know. And where I live, in Canada, those freedoms have become intimately involved with the whole business of running a country. What's going on back there may well be Canada's single most important contribution to democratic freedom of information. I believe it's a Canadian invention. It's called the scrum. The scrum in English rugby football is what happens when the players all bunch together head to head, struggling for control of the ball. But here, the players are members of parliament, even members of the government, and journalists from the parliamentary press gallery. Now, the parliamentary press gallery used to be pretty polite, even deferential in its reporting of what goes on in Parliament, but not anymore. It's become now a kind of unofficial opposition. And what goes on in here is a kind of public accountability session in which ministers and other members of Parliament are vocally challenged to defend what they're doing. The committee hearings are a fraud and a sham. Listen, we're starting to repeat ourselves. You don't like it? I think I've expressed my dislike. And I'm saying that he is misleading the House. He is not telling the truth. The Prime Minister must demand her resignation. Let me, let, me refresh your, let me refresh your memory on the Sinclair Stevens case. The journalists justify what they're doing on grounds of the public interest. They're asking questions that the public would never get a chance to ask for themselves. And the Scrum has become one more way in which members of the Canadian media can not only report on, but take part in the national debate. Oh, by the way, some members of Parliament complain about this unruly circus of cameras and journalists right outside the chamber of the House of Commons. But none of them is obliged to come here. Ironically, Back in London, where our Canadian Parliament was really invented, the parliamentary reporters, known here as the press lobby, have not yet caught this impudent spirit of participation. Every morning, four days a week, a group of journalists from the press lobby gathers here at 10 Downing Street for a confidential off-the-record briefing by the Prime Minister's press secretary. They have an agreement with 10 Downing Street that nothing said in that meeting will be attributed. In fact, that they won't even admit that the meeting takes place. The constables on duty here don't know that it takes place. But here comes the first of the journalists now. If anyone breaks the confidentiality of this briefing, that journalist will be disciplined, not by 10 Downing Street, not by the Prime Minister or the government, but by the press lobby itself. You used to attend those briefings yourself, and you don't anymore. Why did you stop? Well, we didn't like the fact that they were collective, unattributable briefings. The Prime Minister's press secretary can say uh, what the Prime Minister wants us to know without it being able to, us uh, being able to pin it on them. 
all we wanted was for them to ask for a change for what journalists ought to ask for, which is to get information to be able to attribute it. We don't like the, uh, the, the backstairs uh, cloak and dagger way in which it's done. But our meetings are pretend, pretend, we have to pretend they don't happen. It was ridiculous. It's time for change. How would the sheer fact of attributing information gained in those briefings change the relationship between the press and official Britain? It would mean that uh, the Prime Minister or her press secretary couldn't, for example, rubbish cabinet colleagues behind their backs. I think journalists compromise themselves by going along to meetings that are held in secret to get information which they can't attribute, where things were reported as if they were a general government view speaking for Britain. I think that's wrong, and I think uh, the journalists themselves need to stand up and ask for a system which is more in the spirit of journalism. For a long time, British journalists were even forbidden to report what went on in Parliament itself. The man who would change all that was well known for his part in meetings that also went on behind closed doors. Face que vous draw. It's Rabelaisian French for do what you like. It was the motto of a club that used to hold sexual orgies in this old abbey, the Knights of St. Francis of Wickham. One of their members was an ugly, eloquent man named John Wilkes, one of the great champions of British liberty. There should be monuments to him, along with old Cromwell and Tom Paine and Wilberforce. But there aren't. And I bet that's because he was such a notorious fornicator. And generations of embarrassed schoolmasters have suppressed his reputation. Wilkes wrote and published a tough, critical paper called The North Britain, King George III and members of Parliament hated it, and him. But the voters didn't. They elected him to Parliament with a huge majority. His London following was so formidable that Wilkes was able to fight and win a long court battle for the right to report what happened in Parliament. When the Prime Minister goes to Washington, will she note the contrast between the democratically elected Congress of the United States currently exposing the existence of a state within the state and her persistent refusal to allow any independent investigation of the quite serious charges raised in Mr. Peter Wright's book about covert operations against the former Prime Minister. Nowadays, Parliament's own stenographers take down every word. You speak of the Prime Minister. I do not answer for the United States. I for the United States, but, but I ask the right honourable gentleman to consider which has the more effective security service. <laughs> All over the world, British-style parliaments call these transcripts Hansard, after a firm founded by London printer Luke Hansard, whose family began printing reports of Parliament in 1803. It looked as if Britons had finally won the right to know what their elected representatives were saying in this building. And here they all are, all the words that have been spoken in Parliament here in Westminster ever since. Quite a bit of ground covered since that early member of Parliament who objected to any reporting of the proceedings of the House of Commons on the grounds that he might then be held accountable outside Parliament for what he had said within it. But I was surprised to learn that in England, reporting on Parliament is not guaranteed by law. It's a privilege. Parliamentarians can still, technically, stop it at any moment. And Parliament, within this century, passed one law that's at war with Britain's great traditions of liberty. It normally takes months to get a piece of legislation passed through the House of Commons here. But one hot day in 1911, MPs passed amendments to the Official Secrets Act in a single afternoon. These were amendments that were designed to improve national security. But they've been used to hamper public participation in the democratic process by covering up inefficiency and corruption and by obscuring the sources of power. Importantly, this is an act that reflects the deep conviction of the people who rule England that in this country the people don't have the right to know. Duncan Campbell is an aggressive, eccentric freelance reporter whose fellow journalists frequently find him to be an embarrassment. His dogged pursuit of officially suppressed stories they see as, well, not quite the thing to do. In 1987, 
Campbell got into trouble with a television series on government secrecy that he wrote and narrated for the BBC. In one episode, he revealed how the British government had financed a spy satellite called Zircon without even telling Parliament about it. When it was being debated within the BBC, I did try to point out to them that the courageous thing to do was to ban it because to actually ban a program creates a huge public row, whereas to show it would mean two million people watched it, three questions were asked in Parliament, and everybody forgot about it. What happened with the Zirkin affair, of course, absolutely overtopped what we expected. The 28 hours the special branch officers spent inside Broadcasting House in Glasgow were marked by legal argument and controversy. Late last night, the police did comply with a court order instructing them to return all the material they'd seized earlier, but they brought a new warrant to repossess it. But that warrant was for the wrong address. The BBC objected to a third warrant produced. Like the first, they said, its scope was far too wide. But at one o'clock, the police left, with the same boxes full of items relating to the entire Secret Society series. It wasn't about the disclosures that were in the film and the program, but about the fact that the Prime Minister was embarrassed. Very embarrassed because we, we tripped her flat on her face by letting her be obsessed with stopping members of Parliament from seeing my program, which I arranged to do, and she became so obsessed with that, she didn't actually realize we were in the middle of publishing the story anyway. So the very day she was sort of trying to get members of Parliament to sort of put on loyal national security blindfolds, out we came with the story of the new statesman. Outside his home, Mr. Campbell expressed his anger and resentment about what the police were being asked to do. I think that this is the tactics of Eastern Europe and of South Africa. What is about to go on here is a vindictive attempt to placate the Prime Minister's political embarrassment by seeking revenge. It's not like this in the film, is it? With his domestic security proving embarrassingly good, the only answer now was to force the door. <laughs> Files, books and furniture were thoroughly searched. The police, though, were keen to keep things well out of the public view. Just two hours ago, they left, carrying a case with nine items inside. Duncan Campbell was quite unconcerned. Zirkin Challenge I produced because there was a lot of allegations that my coming out with the story that we were getting the spy satellite damaged national security. I said that was a load of bunkum. Uh, and to make the point very simply so people could understand it, I said, okay, the first person who can read the article and tell me and tell a panel of international expert judges one way in which that information can be used by the Soviet Union to damage British security gets this trophy and a check for a thousand pounds from me personally. No takers. No challengers? No. All these journalists who so complacently wrote, you know, the words they were fed in the lobby and in, in, in right-wing newspapers said, you know, this has grotesquely damaged national security. I said, okay, prove it. Just tell me one way. They would ring me up and say, surely you accept this has damaged national security. And I said, no, I don't. But if you can explain it to me, I'll accept it. And they said, well, I'm told it is. And I just said, well, how? Oh, well, we don't know. We just take the words of experts. You know, at which point you have to say... You're a journalist. You're out there supposed to be asking the questions for the public. You come to me and make a most damaging accusation, and you can't back it up. You don't understand it. That is the culture in this country, a culture of accepting something because somebody important says it's so. A senior British civil servant has said that anything in an official file is an official secret. This qualifies. By having it in my possession, I'm breaking the law. And what's more, if I pass on to you the information in this file, which I'm about to do, although no British jury would convict us, the law says we could both go to prison for up to two years. And it's not even a secret of the British defense system. It's just a humble menu from the canteen of the Ministry of Defense over there. But if I tell you that you can have fillet of place with lemon in that canteen for 125p, I'm breaking the Official Secrets Act. The information that most people are concerned about is not the sort of you know, high-value stuff about what we're doing in defense and nuclear policy. It's about the things they are most affected by in their lives, their health files, their social security information, um, their water rates. 
uh, the safety of products they buy. Well, you're not telling me that people can't find out about their water rates. Uh, quite specifically, so far as water boards are concerned, um, they used to be open until 1981. A new law was passed allowing them to meet in secret. So what is going on inside water boards is now secret, where once it was open. Uh, information about the safety of medicines is officially secret. It's a criminal offense if uh, any information about safety of medicines is released unauthorized to the public. Take something like animal testing, drugs tests on animals, a controversial area because the British people just love animals. A new law has been passed, an official secrets act for those who you cut up animals or whatever to, to make tests on them. Two years imprisonment if you're inside that business and disclose to a member of the public or the journalist where or what goes on in an animal testing laboratory. I'm not saying that there isn't information which should be kept confidential, but the presumption in Britain is that it's a criminal offence for which people could or should go to prison for learning information any information in any area, nothing to do with the nation's defenses, economy, or intelligence. You, the burden is on the citizen to throw off a criminal prosecution against them if they learn anything about what the government is doing. One such criminal prosecution was launched against a senior civil servant, Clive Ponting, OBE, of the Ministry of Defense. During the Falklands War, when the Prime Minister had ordered a British submarine to attack the Argentine cruiser, General Belgrano, Ponting found out that the Belgrano was in fact heading away from the war zone. And 368 Argentine lives had been needlessly lost, along with many British killed in reprisal. Ponting also knew that the government had misled Parliament about the Belgrano, and that two years later, a cover-up was still in effect. And it was at that point that I decided that really I was the one person who, first of all, knew what had actually taken place in 1982 and about the cover-up and also what the government were doing now. And so I sent some papers to a member of parliament so that he could see what had been going on and actually giving the correct information and showing the cover-up. Uh, I was then, when the papers were sent back to the Ministry of Defence, I was arrested and put on trial under the Official Secrets Act for giving these papers to the MP. And uh, there was a trial that lasted a fortnight at the Old Bailey. Official Britain cherishes its secrets, and the judge wanted a conviction. But the jury, 12 ordinary men and women, would not go along. They acquitted Ponting unanimously. And yet, despite the fact that he became a hero to popular Britain, Ponting retains a very black view of official Britain. Britain is perhaps the most secretive democracy this side of the Iron Curtain. I mean, it's had no real tradition of open government. Its, it's government is very closed, internal, doesn't really regard itself as accountable in any real extent. I mean, ministers answer questions in the House of Commons, but that is really the extent of the accountability. And the whole processes of government are very closed. And I think the, the remedy is to have a form of freedom of information where the people and those who are interested are able to get at the information. I don't see how you, in a democracy, you can have an informed public debate about issues unless people have got information. It's the old adage that information is power. And of course the bureaucracy and governments like to keep the information to themselves and have the power. It's an absolute disaster. People brought up in Britain to think that Nanny knows best. It's an utterly anti-democratic idea. And you start with Nanny knows best, teacher knows best, schoolmaster knows best, policeman knows best, person in Whitehall knows best, the Prime Minister knows best, that's what's good for you, so shut up and take it. And that is far too far inculcated at every level of the system, deference to authority. The idea that if people wear pips on their shoulders, they know what's best. If you're brought up American, at least, thank God, you think the opposite. If somebody's gone to Washington, you know they're up to no good. This is the place where, in recent years, more lies and double-dealing and conspiracy have been exposed to the American people than anywhere else. Senate caucus room. Not reporters, but politicians acting as both investigator, prosecutor, and judge, trying to ferret out some truth. Before an audience of millions, the American people, the world. Trial by television. Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North sat right there. 
and argued that his secret operations were in support of a free and open society. And just before those Iran-Contra hearings wound up, co-chairman Lee Hamilton said some words that are so central to what I think I understand about freedom and democracy that if there were only one lesson to be found in this whole story, those words would be it. A democratic government, as I understand it, is not a solution, but it's a way of seeking solutions. It's not a government devoted to a particular objective, but a form of government which specifies means and methods of achieving objectives. Methods and means are what this country are all about. If we subvert our democratic process to bring about a desired end, no matter how strongly we may believe in that end, we've weakened our country and we have not strengthened it. The United States was born out of revolution and then survived the gruesome test of a civil war and through its testing became a mature democracy. And that's why Chairman Hamilton could sit over there and talk about ways and means being more important than objectives, ends. But right on this country's border, there's another nation that is not quite ready for that much democracy. Mexico City, May Day. What the Mexican people will see on television of these celebrations is what the government wants them to see. They will not see this part. This building is the headquarters of PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Institutional Revolution, that's kind of a contradiction, but that doesn't matter because PRI has been the party in power here in Mexico since the year I was born. It's not strictly speaking a one-party state, but in many ways, PRI has become the state. It's absorbed into itself all those contending elements that might otherwise be very divisive. Labor, business, the church, the army, the bureaucrats, the intellectuals, the students, and to a sorrowful degree, the journalists. In the name of stability, Stability is more important here in Mexico than democracy. And so, in 1968, when students here, like students all over the world, began demonstrating for more democracy, what they got instead was bullets. Empezó a agrupar la gente allí bajo el edificio Chihuahua, y el meeting transcurría normalmente. No había ningún problema. Pero como al tercer orador, por esta rampa empezaron a bajar los soldados, hubo un disparo de bengala a la altura de la iglesia y empezó la, la balacera. Disparaban indiscriminadamente y la zona estuvo cercada cuatro días. Oficialmente, the government declared about 50 dead. The estimates made by the student movement were closer to 500 and 5,000 more arrested, and, still according to the students, a considerable number who just disappeared. The press was virtually silent. At the time of the student protest and the massacre in 1968, the Minister of the Interior was Luis Echeferria, Echeverria became president in 1970, convinced that the national sense of frustration and unrest was reaching a boiling point, and that he had to find some kind of a safety valve. He decided that one way to relieve the pressure was to encourage a certain amount of public criticism of the government. And of all the press response to that invitation, the most dramatic came from this newspaper, Excelsior. Excelsior was already a bit different from the others, which tended to be owned by wealthy families, whereas Excelsior was a cooperative. And it had been publishing for years within the well-known rules about what you can say and what you can't say. But all of a sudden, it transformed itself into a real newspaper with investigative stories and reliable reporting and editorial opinion from across the whole political spectrum.
This was tolerable because the government knew it could cool off a paper just by threatening to stop supplying newsprint. But when Excelsior began to hammer the president on foreign policy, Echeverria blew a fuse and sent in the goons. They forced the editor down these stairs, running a gauntlet of straw-hatted, white-gloved gunmen. That editor was Julio Scherer. El presidente Echeverría no soportó ese tipo de periodismo. Echeverría just couldn't take this kind of journalism. That's what I'm saying. No, so it didn't have anything to do with the size of your no. circulation and the number of people. Yo no podría, yo no podría decir lo que pensaba Echeverría. I can't tell you what Echeverría was thinking. Yo lo que sé es que no soportó un periodismo que no aceptaba sus consignas. What I can tell you is that he just couldn't accept a kind of journalism that didn't uh, support his uh, slogans or his line. He now runs Proceso, a small weekly for a small readership. Proceso carries no government paid stories. Most newspapers do, disguising this propaganda or government advertising as news. Only a few provide a clue as to what is real news and what's government paid. Let's see here in this page. There's a difference in the headings here. Mm -hmm. This is a paid advertisement. But it is drawn as if it were a news story. The letters are different. Is this the editor's, uh, the editor's way of showing the reader? No, this, uh, this is uh, not, not showing the reader, but, but showing the reporters. This is another one. This one is paid by the government. And these are two pieces of news stories. You can see the difference in this newspaper because the reporters protested and uh, demanded that there would be a difference between the two things. But you cannot see that in the, in the rest of the newspapers. Everything is exactly the same. And there are even uh, <coughs> photographs paid by the government to be printed in the front page. And you cannot see the difference. Uh, everything is the same. That's a way of... Uh, Promoting government policy. That's that, right. Under the guise of news. That's right. We've heard about the government leaning on newspapers by withholding advertising or withholding newsprint supplies. What did they do in the case of journalists? Yeah, the, well, the practice here is uh, what we call embute. That is an envelope with money that is given to you in your source of information, say pre, say the Ministry, the ministry of the Interior, say the Presidency, say whatever you, whatever you wish, except in the Church. So uh, you, give, you, you receive this money. They tell you it, uh, it's with no attachments at all, no conditions. But if you don't behave yourself after you are accustomed to a certain level of living because of that money, then they cut off the money to you, from you. So uh, the problem is, all of a sudden, you drop your level of life. And that's a problem with your wife, your children, uh, and so on and so forth. So you come back to the, to, to the good behavior. On the 30th of May, 1984, someone was waiting back here in the shadows with a pistol. About 6.30 in the afternoon, he stepped forward quickly stepped in behind a man who had just come out of that building, grabbed the man by the shirt, thrust the pistol in his back, and before the victim could get his own gun out, fired. Just another gangland killing? Well, no. The body that fell down there on the sidewalk was that of Manuel Buendia, Mexico's most distinguished, most outspoken investigative journalist, murdered almost surely because of what he wrote. On oh, another thing, there was an eclipse of the sun going on at the time. For journalists here in Mexico, that's not just a casual metaphor. Wendia was one of some 40 Mexican journalists who were murdered in the last 15 years. My Mexican colleague, Lilia Rubio, knew him well. He was the most influential reporter, journalist in Mexico had. Uh, he had uh, information from the government, from people who would give him information, and he would also get information from people from all walks of life, in the country and outside of Mexico also. He would write uh, about the CIA maneuvers, the CIA uh, sabotage uh, techniques in Mexico and uh, in other countries. He would at the same time write about uh, the very corrupt uh, oil union leaders in Mexico protected by the government. He would also write against the government 
you would know that everything he wrote about, he could uh, have evidence to, to prove that he was uh, that he knew what he was writing about, what he was talking about. Um, the the woman who who was the attorney general of the uh, of the city has now been moved from her post, and one of the main reasons, not the only one, but one of the main reasons for her removal was the case of Wendy Ann, which one day she says, look, this is, we're not going anywhere in our investigation, we don't know what's happened, we're impotent in this. So now she's been removed, of course, she was given, given a better post. This is a country in which journalists get murdered. Uh, do you ever feel that your life's in danger here? That, that I couldn't, I couldn't answer that. We don't think we are in danger. But there have been threats. I think you even suspended publication once. Tell me about that. Yes, it was a feature article we, I wrote myself uh, on, the on the Minister of, um, of the Interior. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. it was a family matter somehow, but uh, the government was involved in this family matter. So I wrote the feature article on that, and uh, all of a sudden, on uh, one Friday evening, uh, the police came here. Was this before it was published? Before it was published, yeah. They knew we were publishing it, I don't know how, and uh, somehow the, the police came here, the chief of police, and then he first offered money, then he, he, he started threatening uh, ourselves and uh, even our families. And uh, we had to suspend the publication of the of the article because uh, we thought the threats were really heavy and real. But sometimes we don't know, and uh, <clears throat> it's always the doubt, and uh, we really don't know. <clears throat> I believe we are not in danger. I believe that. Because I think we have been very serious. I think uh, uh, we are... Uh, useful as uh, safety valve and... Uh, and, uh, and so many things. I, I don't think we are in danger, really. Safety valve is a word we hear a lot in Mexico, and what it means to me is you take the pressure off and then nothing happens. There's no explosion. Things That's, go on. That is it. And I can explain that with many telephone calls I've received. Wonderful, your article. Finally, you, you told them what they deserve. Thank you very much. And that's all. Isn't that's that, all. Isn't that a little frustrating? Yes, it sure is. But the country is that way. The problem is not journalism. The problem is the country. Government monopoly on newsprint. And then massive contracts for government advertising, including advertising that masquerades as news stories. And then the embooty, the payoff, the favors. It all adds up to a press that the government could be pretty comfortable with. But it's not a victimized press entirely. We hear stories about newspapers threatening to publish scathing pieces about officials unless there's a payoff usually in the form of advertising. So corruption walks both sides of the streets and it does mean that a certain amount of criticism is possible up to a point. There is criticism in these pages of the administration but that kind of profound fundamental criticism that digs into the crevices of the system itself that's really exceptional. Texas on the left, Matamoros, Mexico on the right. Diana Munoz reports on both towns. She has brought back to her Texas television station stories from Matamoros that tie together the drug traffic, dirty politics, a corrupt press, and murder. I have uh, friends with some of the journalists in Mexico, and I talk with them about their experiences. The way I feel is that they're, we're both aggressive reporters, but they don't believe so much in 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 double checking their facts. They they 
whatever, you know, they have one source, they'll go with that. A lot of times they won't reveal their sources. You really don't know if it's true or not. They, they'll go on rumors. They'll do a story on rumors. you got to understand, we're close to the border, and you're going to find out that a lot of the stories are related to drugs. The murders, ten, nine times out of ten, the murders that you find in Brownsville and over there are, are related to drugs. Um, are there just as many Brownsville murders as Matamoros murders? Oh, no, not at all. I mean... I'd say up to now, begin, you know, this year, we've got maybe like maybe two or three. They've got probably well over 50 by now. How would you feel about living and working over there? I would never consider being, you know, being a reporter for Mexico um, or working in Matamoros. It's, it's just too dangerous. I mean, there's only two types of journalists there. And it's, you know, if, if you do, do decide to report corruption, I really feel that a lot of those reporters live in fear. Lo mejor de la música regional. A continuación, esta melodía ya tradicional para ustedes se llama El Chubasco, aquí en W Radio, lo especial. Continuamos. I went to this Matamoros radio station to check out a story about journalists living in fear. The owner's a former mayor of Matamoros, Jorge Cardenas. I'd heard that he used to run a big, tough, aggressive news service. I wanted to find out why he stopped. Cardenas was not very forthcoming. Where do you get your local news from if you haven't got any reporters? We have one reporter. For one whole news operation? Para todo, cubrir todo, toda la cobertura. Policía, Cruz Roja, Bomberos. Red Cross, Firemen. He must work very hard. Debe trabajar así. Finally it came out. Somebody in Matamoros had taken exception to the political news and sprayed the place with machine gun bullets. Now, the only news gatherer I could find working in the place was this. El problema que tenemos the problem we have is that all countries have a certain level of corruption. That's ya me very clear. Unidos, United Inglaterra, States, Alemania, England, Rusia. Germany, Russia. Nosotros. We. Somos, yo creo que unos que están, we're also, muy arriba, we're also uh, we also have certain level of problems. We all have problems. Does that mean that whoever has the most money gets the most airtime? Quiere decir que el que más dinero tenga más espacio puede tener en los medios. Claro, no puede pagar más. Because he can pay It's more. Lógico. It's logical. Is it good democracy? Es es uh, democracia. Bueno, no está, está, está confundiendo. You're, ahí, you're ahí, mixing things. Ahí sí está confundiendo you're democracia things. con recursos económicos. Mixing democracy with uh, economic resources. Well, some countries. Put... Mire, le voy a explicar una cosa. Let me explain this. Okay. Para ser yo alcalde en Matamoros. In order for me to have been a, mi, a mayor here in Matamoros, my radio station served me. Como no pude pagar, no hubo un, un momento en que me cerraron los medios de información aquí. Pay because aquí, I wasn't able, I didn't have access to other mass media due to union pressures. Mandé I had the need lado. of having a, a, a paper a in, in Harlinger. Harlinger. Yes. Everybody that we've spoken to in Mexico so far has said that there are clean papers, and there are papers that are corrupt in the sense that they are paid to write certain things, and most papers are corrupt. Are there any clean papers in Matamoros? Esa es una pregunta de los 64 mil pesos. That's a very 64,000 pesos question you have there. Back across the river at the Brownsville Herald with its rigid code of journalistic ethics, reporter Hector Garza had one answer to that 64,000 peso question. He showed me a list of Matamoros reporters with the amount of embuti each one gets from City Hall. And uh, I confronted the, the, the press secretary and he said that, he didn't deny it, but he said that he had no idea who had passed the list around. What do you think of the validity of it yourself? Uh, I know some reporters personally and they uh, they have admitted that they do get some money from City Hall. Like I said, they call it advertising. Any, did anybody in Matamoros print the list? No. No. Uh, the only the only one who could have done it was a popular. Because they were they are the only newspaper not included in the list, basically. At El Popular, Amelia Hilda Flores is proud that her paper is not on that list of City Hall payouts. She is a hands-on editor-publisher, personally guiding every aspect of the work, sales, printing, distribution, layout, reporting. The crime section is her biggest. 
and her biggest crime reporter works beneath an armored window. On his beat, there are very few soft news days. The day before we arrived, the kidnapped victim's body had turned up in a field. A grisly story, but a fairly routine one for these two journalists. Eight months earlier, on the doorstep of this very building, Amelia Flores had covered a murder that would change her life. The owner of the Matamoros newspaper and one of its reporters died after they were ambushed this morning. 48-year-old Ernesto Flores Torijos and 24-year-old Norma Moreno Figueroa were sprayed with bullets as they got out of this Bronco. Both took bullets between the eyes. They said to me that my husband, that something happened to my husband and, and Norma Moreno, that they got killed. And... Um, and I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I wasn't. I was ready to get in the shower, and I took some clothes and put on, and came, and came right away. I drove, and as soon as, as soon as I got about half a block from, you know, this park, I seen all the traffic. I mean, uh, a lot of cars, and, and I left the car there, and, and I ran, and I, I just found them here, you know, lying on the floor. Did anyone see it happen? There were people working here. You know, the workers, they were, they were here. There's always, by 7 o'clock, there's, so, there's always people in the, you know, in the field over here in the park. The workers. Did they give a description of the uh, killers? No, they say they didn't see anything. And, like, there were so many shots, you know. Um, my husband must have got about 25. About 25, and Norma Moreno, I think, uh, she got 11. The journalists at El Popular say they will continue to carry on the paper's vocal and controversial tradition, even if it means looking over their shoulders all the time. Diana Munoz, KGBT News Center 4. And then I went up there and I spoke with Emily, the publisher's wife, and I spoke with some of the reporters there, and, and I just couldn't believe that this had happened right across our border. I cannot imagine anything like that happening here in Brownsville, just a few miles away. What did you figure the motive was at the time? Two, it could be two things. The publisher, I understand, had enemies. There was a dispute over the ownership of that, of that newspaper. So I, it could be that, or it could be because they really were a vocal paper. I know that uh, Flores was uh, a quite honest man, and uh, he had a lot of enemies. Do you think Flores' enemies were uh, political or drug mafia, or uh, both? Uh, it probably was a combination of both, yes. What did the police investigation turn up? The police? They never came to me to say anything, we got this or that, and I kept asking. And later on I found out that they lost the, f the files, my husband. Why did they lost them? I don't know. And it's all no. over now? Have they given up the investigation? Completely. She went to the newsroom, to the uh, Popular's newsroom, and talked to the reporters, most of whom, most of whom were crying. And she just stood there and told them, the show, the show has to go on, and we have to print today's paper. So get to work and be as objective as possible, printing the killing of my husband. And they just went on to work. And uh, after that, about 10 minutes after talking to the newsroom, she just exploded in tears, in tears and screams. I think she she does it for her husband. I really, from the more I get to know her, it's, it's a crusade for her. And people like her are, they don't care about anything else. They care about only, she doesn't have any children, she doesn't have any family. The paper is her life. That's, and that's, she'll do whatever she has to do. I think if, if you want to live in Matamoros, you have to be, you have to wash out for what you said. And we hear there's not too many people, the ones to talk, the ones to, Give information. A sensible woman, after her husband had been murdered for something the newspaper did, would have left town. But you stayed here and kept the newspaper running. Doesn't that sound a little bit crazy to you? Could be. Uh, I mean, uh, but that's what uh, what uh, I learned from from Vanessa Flores. I mean, I try I try my my best. I I don't know much about about the business. It's it's the truth. I probably I have. 
No problem. I don't have the capacity of a, of a, an editor, but I try my best to keep it going. You know, and as long as I can, I, I will. Uh huh. When Ernesto Flores first met her, okay. she was only 13 years old. I thought this was a streetwise kid who knew how to survive in these border towns where the drug traffic is a way of life and death. And I couldn't suppress some nagging doubt. Where did the paper's money really come from? Here, if I wanted to take out an ad for uh, my television program, how much would it cost me to buy a full page? 150,000 pages. Should be about 150 dollars. And, uh, and, and we print it from, you know, people from the United States, it cost them 400 dollars. Actually, on the political page, uh, it will cost 450 thousand pesos. For a political ad? Uh huh, for the political ad. Uh -huh. yes. the, the publicity of many papers is expensive. Because the, the space, it's, it's important. You know, the, the people that, you know, I can't, and I don't like to have a lot of publicity, a lot of advertising, because I can't take that much information away from the people. The people have the right, they're paying to read information. I did the arithmetic, ads, paid circulation, salaries, costs, and it added up clean. But then, what about the newsprint? If El Popular is really so independent and fearless, why doesn't the government just cut off the paper supply? If uh, the government took away uh, the paper or <clears throat> ink or things like that, we have supplies. And uh, I have supplies for a year. They'll have to burn this newspaper to, you know, and to... Uh, shut us off, they have to really uh, either take it completely away, but it, it could be such a big scandal. I do have enough supplies for a long time, enough time for the government to think that what they're doing is wrong. What keeps her here now? I wondered if these kids might hold a clue. They come in every day from their shanty towns to earn a few pesos as her distribution network. They are part of her Mexico, her people. They have spent so much of their lives on those murderous streets. And at each day's end, she goes out there with them to see that they're okay, to see that the papers are getting to the newsstands and to sell a few copies herself. There is only one head in this newspaper, and, it, it, and that's me, and, and somehow they'll, they'll try to put me away eventually. Are you afraid for your life? No. Why not? Because it helps me. Do you think be, being afraid helps me out? I mean, no, it doesn't. I don't think people get it. I mean, if I wouldn't... I wouldn't be in this business if I, you know, if I was afraid because uh, you have to forget about that completely. You can't be in a business like this if you're afraid. I, I think you have to be strong to be here because I'm fighting, I'm fighting for, for uh, all the injustice or I'm, I'm fighting for justice, I mean, to get justice for for people. And uh, if it takes my life to help out, here it is. If my blood helps to, to clean a little more this town, here it is, take it. And those Brownsville reporters told me, yes, she is out there herself every day, selling her bold little paper on the street. And I concluded that Amelia, Amelia Hilda Flores has somehow caught the same profoundly democratic impulse that once moved William Tyndall, martyr, and has moved so many free spirits since, to get the word out to the people, no matter what the cost.